so this was fun. I'm, I'm, I always enjoy talking down here, and um, it was it was fun following because it was interesting. How many of you guys, in the presentation that was just done, I break speeches up into three types. There's ones I call aspirational, right? And, and a lot of things I'm going to touch on were, were just covered, but aspirational, I want to be something. Inspirational is I'm going to do this. And educational is how the heck am I going to do it? My, my topic is very educational. I, I'm not a big storyteller. I'm going to go through some things that um, may have resonance for you now, but I guarantee will have resonance for you over the next month or two or year. Because I'm going to teach you some very specific tactical things about how to grow a business, how to think differently, just sort of a, a process of information. And it'll work if the presentation comes up. If you need my computer, fine, you got it? Yeah, I'm going to need yours. Okay. I could have brought mine down, so I put it door fine. Yeah. They're good. They're good. They're good. So one's on the thumb drive, and then the other one's just for the. So uh, is this PowerPoint or is this PowerPoint? Yeah, PowerPoint? So you don't go into slideshow mode, just advance <laughs> manually because for some reason with this projector, um, when I go into slideshow mode, it goes black. Is this, you know? But that's what this does, it's on slideshow. Yeah, you, you can, yeah, you're not going to be able to do that, sorry. I'm not? Uh -oh. You're going to be able to show the slides, but you can't, um, you can't do it in, in slideshow mode. Pardon us. Once this comes up, guys, for, for sake of time, I'll fly through. So there, there's a lot of content on here. Just to be clear, some of these slides are very text heavy. That's what uh, but anybody that wants copies, I always leave it with Seth because I'm going to go through about three hours worth of content in a very, very short period of time. All right, so hopefully we'll, we'll get through. But any of you that wants a slide, we're going to. Waifu? 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 Right here. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to open it in Keynote so you can actually use your little clicker that you love so much. Thank you. This will work. They have weird projection. Okay. Let's put that down going on. Make sure that almost there. Sorry guys. Okay, there you go. Okay. And slide one? Yep. Put right. that in your good, please. <laughs> yeah, so all my contacts up there, but I, I start out so the topic I'm gonna do just real quick. Um, I joke with everybody when I give these speeches, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. The reality is I've never had a job. The real reality is I'm unhirable. <laughs> and, and I didn't know in college I was going through interviews and, and I was really struggling. I was taking personality tests and it wasn't until many years later, I'm really, really good at one thing. If I were ever going to hire me in a company, it's for one specific thing. And a lot of times in corporations, you have to be inside a box, you have to follow a certain process. And if you're a thinker outside of that, it tends to make things work a little differently. So as I'm going through this, I, I'm going to just share a lot of this is psychology. A lot of it is very tactical. right? And the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask questions. And in the entire presentation, there's one trick question. I will warn you before the trick question. And it's a trick question that has two parts where you'll usually screw up both parts. So, don't feel bad about answering anything because the only trick question I'll answer. But let's start out with this. Uh, I, I started a premise called isolation is a good thing. So if I tell you isolation, what's the first thing that usually comes to mind when somebody says the word isolation? Loneliness. Prison. Prison. Solitary. Solitary confinement. So let's think about this for a minute. Just when we think the word isolation, it's a negative connotation. It produces a negative psychology, the physiology, everything is there. If I put this picture up, I've just taken you down the path of something very negative. If I change and say, here's what it is, but I'm going to change and say this, ah, isolation is a good thing. Here's the point of this. If you think of this picture, when you think of the word isolation, it changes your entire physiology changes how you think about things. The reason I start with this is there's a lot of negativity in the world. There's a lot of pressure coming from other people. 
There's a lot of self-talk just in the pictures we tell ourselves of the words that are associated. If you want to change your perception on things, change the pictures that you're telling yourself around the work. Does that make sense? All right, especially as filmmakers and storytellers, this stuff is critical. So to me, isolation is about being specific, targeted, and focused. Anytime I tell somebody, oh, isolation's a good thing, they're going, well, what? Like being alone? I didn't mean being alone. Right? Any of you guys work out? Right? Tuesday is leg day. Wednesday is arm day. You're isolating muscles. You're picking a target. You're focused. Isolation's good. You've got to know exactly what you want and figure out how to get it. In life, there are only two things you can control. Your actions and your attitude. Right? Think about for a minute. I don't have time to go through all of this, but that is all you can control. When things happen, the markets collapse, a movie doesn't work. Some, you, all you can control are your actions and your attitude towards what's going on. You can't control what people are going to think. You can't control what the markets are going to do. Actions and attitude are it. So you've got to work really hard at learning how to control that. This is a cool little slide. It should work. Does everybody see it spinning? This is not an animation. All right, but here's the trick. Here's how this works. I want all of you to pick a single black dot and stare at the dot and tell me what happens. Right? A couple of you got it really quickly. It stops spinning. Again, these are all just fun slides. This isn't the educational part. Here's the point. <laughs> I didn't tell you which dot to pick. But when you stared and focused, the whole world stopped spinning. Right? There's a lot of distractions that are always going on. There's school, there's family, there's parents, there's friends. You have to pick a dot and focus on it and let the world spin around you. You've got to control everything you can. Little movie quote, not a big movie buff. Some of you guys may have seen this. This is again dated, Alice in Wonderland. Right? When she asks, well, where do you want to go? She says, I don't care. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So what we're going to talk about is how do you figure out where you want to go? And this is the last slide, I think, for, for graphics. This goes over really well in the South. In LA, I get some groans. But here's the, here's the point of this slide. If you're a leader, you usually have your followers. If you don't know where you're going, it could be dangerous for the people following you. I know, I get the groans in LA. <laughs> Right? But it's just like when, when you were talking earlier. It, right? You didn't go into a project saying, here's where we're going. It's what's the strategy? What's the focus? What's the market? What's the competition? If you don't know where you're going and you've got people relying on you, it is a very dangerous path. Right? This one will help all of you guys going through school, going through movies, going through relationships. And I want you to answer these with me if you can. It's a nice little exercise. Right? And it's called values. Not everybody knows what values are. I'm going to try and show you something. So the first one says, birds of a feather flock together, but opposites. All right, let's try another one. I'll read them over here. Your word is your bond, but don't believe everything you hear. Right? Not trick questions. They're close. You have to see it too, but looks can be. Absence makes the heart grow, but out of sight, out of mind. We got a problem. For every action, there's an opposite reaction. So let's figure out a quote. Everybody's a genius. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it lives its whole life being stupid. Anybody know who said this? Everybody's a genius. Albert Einstein. Einstein was pretty smart. He thinks everybody's a genius. Here's another quote. Two things in the universe are infinite. Or two things are infinite. The universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. So whoever said this thinks the only thing that's infinite in the universe is human stupidity. That was also Einstein. So on one quote, everybody's a genius, the other one, everybody's stupid. The point is, guys, you're going to spend a career having a belief system and there's going to be somebody else who always thinks you're wrong. They think what you're doing doesn't work, a movie's not going to work, a project's not going to work, a relationship isn't right. No matter what you believe, somebody's going to believe the exact opposite. You can't worry about it. You've got to have a belief system and stick to it. All right? So let's do this. What's your vision? Do, do all you guys know what you're going to do after school? Do you know what you want to do the next two, three, five, ten years? 
No? All right, this will help you. All right, I'm not a big, let's set a bunch of goals. But from a vision standpoint, you, what we're going to do is you've got to say, how do we figure out what we want in life? All right, and I'm not talking about a job. I don't design jobs. I design lifestyle, destinies. So we're going to figure out some things, and here's how we do it. This is where the educational stuff starts in. A lot of this is going to get very text heavy. We're going to move quickly. Step number one in my process is called design your destiny. All right. Again, a lot of this is sales driven, some is network driven, some will help you with jobs and things like that. But design your destiny says if I'm looking at my life 10 years out from now and I'm standing on top of a mountain taking a deep breath looking around, what do I want my life to be like? What kind of people do I want to be around? What impact do I want? Do I want to do a product? Do I want to do a service? Do I want to be a producer? Do I want to be a director? Do I want to own a company? It's, you've got to look out in the future and say, here's what I want to be doing. Here's the kind of people I'd like to be around. Here's the impact I want in my life. And when you design this, you come up with 10 or 12 or 13 criteria of things you want your life to be like. And that's what you measure your opportunities against. Coming out of school, you may have two or three offers. You may have different companies. You may have different ideas. You want to measure your decisions against a defined outcome, but you have to define that outcome. And this is a process. That's why I said I'm going to fly through it, but, but think about what you want to do. Most people think success looks like this straight up. It's not. It's ugly and messy. But we always see people at the top. We see people when they've been successful and think, boy, that's easy. And when you look behind the scenes, nothing is ever easy. All right? So here's step two. This one takes a little bit of work. It was mentioned earlier. This is what, this is what I, I love about you know, the, the way the, the presentations work. Inspirational, educational, they're both a little different. Wiffa Wiffa means this. This is LA. LA is a really Wiffum driven town. Does everybody know what Wiffum is? Nobody knows what's Wiffum? What's in it for me? A lot of people you meet in this town, boy, it's all like, what's in it for me? They're, you know, they're out there trying to get their own. Wiffu Wiffum says, what's in it for you? How can I figure out how to add value to the other person? What can I do to help that person? And some of it is just a mentality switch. When you meet somebody, if your first premise is thinking, how can I help this person? You'll approach a situation and a conversation differently. And it needs to manifest down not just into things as simple as thought process. We do this in email. Right? And I'll actually I'll use the guy's name. I don't usually use the names. But um, we were trying to get a meeting a couple years ago with Steve McPherson, who was president of, of Disney or ABC. 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 Created Dancer with the Stars, Desperate Housewives. Steve was a big guy at the time. Ran into a little trouble at Disney, left, was looking for something to do. I'm working with a friend of mine. We wanted to get a meeting, and, and Seth knows him. This guy named John Pattison talks. John's won three Emmys, launched a bunch of TV shows. So John writes this email. You know, not this, but his email was, you know, I'm John, and here's what I've done, and I've won an Emmy, and I launched this, and I worked with Dr. Phil, and I created EP. It was three paragraphs of dribble about all the great stuff John did trying to get a meeting because he was trying to impress the former president of ABC. I took that same email, spun it around to three sentences. And the email was basically, you know, Mr. McPherson, you and I haven't met, but I read about you recently, and I read that you were trying to create something to do next to leave a legacy for your daughters. I might have something that could help you achieve that. Can we meet for coffee? So I started the email with you, not me. It wasn't I, it's you. I always start an email, you and I didn't meet, you and I haven't spoken. You know, when you start a sentence with you, the psychology when that person reads it's completely different because you've made it about that other person. The email was about something I read and a goal he wanted to accomplish. And I might have something to help him accomplish that goal. Our entire premise was to get a meeting with him for him to come to work with us. But there was nothing in the email that made it about us. Does that make sense? I just did this with somebody the other day. I'm going to have him send it to me. Um, he, he had a cover letter. And the cover letter, he was trying to get a job in a finance company. And I'm actually having him send it to me. And he asked me to review the cover letter. And I'm like, you don't want me to review it. No, please, but you don't want me to review it. So I re he goes, review it. I said, all right, I'll be honest. 
I looked at his cover letter. I said, I would absolutely never hire you. This is the worst cover letter I've read in my life. Look of panic. I said, you asked me to review it. His cover letter was, I'd love to work for you. I would learn so much. You know, I would learn how to do spreadsheet. It was all about all the things he would learn. And my point was, I said, the guy you're going to interview with probably has two kids going to college, has a bonus riding on hiring you. Your cover letter needs to be all the things you're going to do for him to support him if he hires you. He could care less that you're going to learn how to read spreadsheets. So just think about it. It's, it's, it's what's in it for you, what's in it for me. Next one. This one's really funny. As you guys start leaving school, somebody's going to say, oh, what do you do? What are you going to school for? Anybody want to tell me what you're going to school for? Again, no right or wrong answer. What's somebody going to school for? What are you going to school for here? Business. Okay. We're all going to school. Okay. So what happens is that means nothing to me because I don't know what cinema means. Right? And this was the, the example I used here. I'm not going to do it because I don't have time. But here's my example. I'm going to tap a song, and I want you guys to tell me what song this is. Ready? What song is that? Exactly. <laughs> it was Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say can you see my... Here's the point. In my head, I'm a rock star. I know exactly what I'm saying. I know exactly what I mean. The challenge when you guys leave school is you've been in a bubble of conversation points where when you say cinema, people know what cinema means. When you say editing, people understand editing. When you move outside into, I won't call it the real world, but a different world, they're not in your head. So as you learn conversation points, you have to learn how to not confuse and disorient people. And when you tell people what you do, there's a more efficient way to do that where people can help and support you. Right. What are these people doing? This is a quasi-trick question. Quasi-trick question. What are they doing? Climbing and repelling. Aha. See, we got climbing and repelling. Some people think rock climbing. I say repelling because it's easier to climb down a mountain than it is to go up. So now there we go. So the point is, how do you start at the top of a mountain and repel down? How do you get introductions? How do you get relationships? How do you start at the top and work your way down? We're going to spend a few minutes on this. This is something we created called a tornado technique. How many people have seen a tornado in real life? A few? Wow. South, Midwest, Oklahoma, Kansas. So. Yeah, Kansas. There we go. All right. Here's the trick question. Warning you in advance. What's the most powerful part of a tornado? What's your name? Never mind. Never mind. That's your name. What's your name? Jordan. All right, Jordan, thank you for participating. That was, a trick that was the trick question. So first, the eye, there is no eye in a tornado. That's an hurricane. It's in a hurricane. And the eye is also the most calmest part of the hurricane. So you're wrong twice. <laughs> that was my trick question, though, I warned you. All right, so here's the point. The most powerful part of a tornado is a little tiny tip that touches the ground. If the tornado never touches the ground, there is no destruction. <clears throat> So we're going to teach you how to funnel down a conversation to be very destructive in your conversations in a positive way. Right? This is moving into the networking side of when you meet somebody, what do you do? Are you looking for a job? There's certain things you do. So here's the way a tornado technique works. is At the top, there's an emotional value of what you do. Any of you that are going to come out of school looking for work, um, there's an emotional value of what you do. But you have to realize most people don't understand what you do. They don't get it and they don't care. I don't mean that pejoratively. Most people don't get what you do and they don't care. But people make decisions emotionally and defend them logically. So if you give them an emotional nugget to hold on to, that's all they're going to remember. Within that, there's certain industries. Again, I'm going to try and overlay it to what you guys are doing. But what this is called is isolation of faces. And it's, it's basically sequencing down where if you say you do cinema, that's a very broad term. If we start sequencing down to industries, and within industries, there's certain companies, and within companies, there's certain titles of people you want to work with or deal with, and then within there, there should be five people that you want to meet right now. And it was mentioned earlier. Again, I'm going to give you guys some examples. That's why I'm going to give you these slides to show you how it works. 
I have people come to me all the time, oh, you know, I, I want to work with Disney. Disney has 87,000 employees. Like, who? Where are, are you? Like, where do you want to go? I have people say, oh, I want to be represented by CAA. I need an agent. Did I break it? No, it's fine. Okay. Right. Keep going. You're on a roll. You know, when they say, hey, I want to be an agent, I, I need an agent at CAA. Well, well, which one? Agents are very specific. Some do television, some do comedy and television, some do drama. If you don't know who the person is you want to meet, it's not my responsibility to figure it out for you. So we're going to figure it out in a way that's very specific. And I'm going to give you guys some examples. So here's one we, a company we have called Ronasar. So I want all of you guys to pay attention as I'm talking and see if you can help me. All right, you ready? We'll talk to this side of the room. Here's what Ronasar is. You ready to help? All right. We're an ASP and an SAS. We're a proprietary platform redeploying assets using electronic currency. We're an ERP initiative, so we don't integrate into a system. We're an initiative under change management and process reengineering to have an EPS system for CFOs. What do we do? Can you help me? All right, let me explain more. Again, this is me knocking. This is when you talk about cinema and editing. People are lost. Here's the way Ronastar works in a tornado technique. I always use Ronastar because it's such an off-the-field company, but I'm going to explain it to you. And as I go through this, pay attention in your mind the pictures that start forming and what I do, and then you'll see how you can help. Ronastar, here's what we do. We have a software company. We help really big companies save a lot of money. We work in industries like automotive, manufacturing, government, public schools. Within there, our clients are United Airlines, NASA, Chicago Public Schools. In those big companies, we talk to the CFO, and we love to meet the CFO for the city of Los Angeles, state of California, LA public schools, things like that. Right? I normally tape that. That's about 27 seconds. What does Ronastar do? We help companies save money, and I'm looking to meet. Everything else is so irrelevant. When you leave school, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to explain to people what you do. It doesn't matter. There's something emotional that they need to remember, and there's something you need. And you've got to close that gap. And what you need may be a person you want to meet, a company you want to work with. It's your job to do that research to figure it out so somebody else can help you. So I've got two other quick examples. Um, breaks it down. Magmo is the one we're working on now. It's a company. It's Instagram on steroids. So all I need somebody to remember is it's Instagram on steroids. We're working in entertainment, we're looking at participant production, lowercase, capital, chief marketing officer. So here's who we want to meet. And my apps are really big. Does anybody know who Jeff Skull is? Participant Productions, Siriana, Kite Runner, Charlie Wilson's War, Contagion. Jeff's done some huge things. Chris Saka, lowercase capital. Chris was just on Shark Tank the other day. Troy Carter, Adam Factory, Lady Gaga's manager. Ashton, Ryan, Scooter was Justin's. See, I don't have a problem going for a really big ask. You guys shouldn't either. When you're, when you're leaving school, you've got the support of the USC Mafia. But it's your responsibility. If you want to work in Disney, it's not just Disney. It's who do you want to work for? Who's the target person? And how do you work a way to get down to somebody helping you? And the last one I did here, this is just if I were going to go get a job, Right, a lot of people leave school. I did this for international marketing. I don't. I always struggle with your Seth on how yeah, to position it, but you guys will get this. If I was graduating in international marketing, I'm not going to go around saying, "Oh, who do you know that's hiring? Who do you know that is hiring for e-commerce or international?" Like, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's too broad. So I'm going to use a tornado <laughs> technique and says, "I just graduated. What I want to do is I want to help companies sell globally into emerging markets. I want to work in China and India." I want to work in industries like manufacturing and transportation. I want to work with companies like Uber, Gilt, TaskRabbit, Alibaba. In those companies, if you know anybody, I'd love to meet the chief marketing officer or head of HR. And directly, I'd like to meet Travis, Kevin Ryan, Eric Gross, Jack Ma, things like that. Does anybody know Travis? Who Travis is? Travis is CEO of Uber. Kevin Ryan is CEO of Gilt. Eric is CEO of TaskRabbit. Jack Ma, CEO of Alibaba. So if I'm getting out of school, I'm going to do my own research. I'm going to not say, oh, is Disney hiring? I'm going to go, I want to work at Disney. Who's head of international marketing? Who runs products internationally? 
You know, can I get to Luke Van Hol, who was CFO of Disney Merchandising Worldwide? It's your responsibility to go through and figure out how to use this to get what you want. Does that make a little sense? All right. Again, that's why I say, guys, some of this is pretty dense um, in, in terms of content heavy. So we're going to talk about this from a networking standpoint. We're going to do a little role playing. What's your name? Xander. Xander. This is going to be really easy. You guys ever do networking events, looking for jobs, things like that? If not, you may, may do it more in your industry. You may not. Xander and I are at a networking event. We have our little name tag on. What do you think the question is everybody's going to ask you when they meet you and you have their name tag on? What's the question you get asked? What's that smell? I'm going to hang out with you one time and see which events you're at. <laughs> what do you think the real question is when you meet somebody at a networking event? It's, so, what do you do? What, do you do? what you're going to learn is to never answer what you do first. This is a psychology called deflect, defer, and disclose. Never answer what you do first, but you have to answer in a way that the brain thinks you answered. It's like ping pong, it's like tennis. So help me out, Xander, don't throw me under the bus here. Ask me a simple question. What do you do? What do you do? Well, what do you do? That is called combat. The mind thinks, wait a minute, what an ass. I asked you a question, you didn't answer me. So again, we're going to massage into this very simply. Ask me again, Xander, last time. Thank you. What do you do? Um, we run a technology company, a little incubator. But anyway, tell me more about you. What do you do? Where'd you get the crazy zombie shirt? That's really cool. So here's my point. When you answer, you're going to answer in a way that thinks, the brain's going to think you answered it, but you didn't give them anything tangible to hang on to. And you're going to defer the question back to where now you're in control of that situation. You want to be in control asking that person what they do. People love to talk about themselves. You're going to control that conversation. Why? You want to learn more about them. You want to figure out how you can help them. Right? Step two, what's in it for you? So as we're going through this, you want to be interested in somebody. But what you want to do right at the bottom here, oh, it almost works. What you want to do is use the tornado technique in reverse. And what I mean by that is when I meet somebody, I don't have time to figure out what they do. The, people do like crazy stuff. So I'll ask somebody when I meet them, oh, all right, that's kind of cool. Like, what do your clients love about you? Tell me what, what, when you work with companies, what do companies love about what you do? That gives me the emotional component. Like, all right, what industries are you in? Like, what are your top three industries you're trying to get into? What's your wish list of companies? Are there certain companies you want to work with? Well, in those companies, who do you sell to? And I ask people all the time, I said, if I'm standing here right now to help you with your business, your job, your career, it doesn't matter, whatever I'm trying to help you with, who are the three to five people you want to meet right now if you could? And almost always there's silence. People don't even know who they want to meet. How am I supposed to help them? Right? So tornado technique in reverse does a lot of things. It sequences the conversation down. It forces somebody to think and answer, but it starts giving you the nuggets of information to see if you can help that person. And it's hyper-efficient when you're talking to them, so it saves you a lot of time. What it also does is called build referral currency. And this is what I mean by referral currency. Here's, here's how it works. Again, this no more trick questions, so everybody can participate with me. What's your name? Yeah. Austin. Austin. So if Austin and I were meeting, could be a coffee meeting, could be anything, the way you do this is, as I'm talking to Austin, I'm asking him, so what do you do? What industry are you in? What's the value? Who are you trying to meet? I'm making mental notes. I'm making mental notes of people who I think I could introduce Austin to. Right? What's in it for you? I'm trying to figure out how to help Austin. Who do I know? Who can I introduce him to? What industry? And once I get there, I'm, what I'm not going to do, guys, and what I don't want you to do is if Austin and I are talking and he, like, tell me some company you want to work with or somebody you want to meet. I don't make uh, it up. Oh, Les. It's about to spend a ton of money on digital. If you guys want to be digital, Les is there. Um, what I'm not going to do is go, oh, gosh, I know Les. I was in, in Seoul. Or we were in Korea. Was it Les that was there with us? No, it was Sumner, Redstone. Sorry. Anyway, my point is what you don't do is go, oh, I know that guy. Oh, I know that person. You want to ask all the questions and make mental notes because what I want to do is I want to get three or four names of who Austin wants to meet. 
And when I'm done, what I want to do is say, Austin, this has been great. I, I think I can help you. Listen, I've, I've got access to less movies. I think I can introduce you to less. I've met Sumner, which is not less movies, but he's kind of the same Sumner Redstone. Uh, so I've got two or three people like that. When we're done, let's talk about how to get introduced to them. But now, dot, 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 this is psychological jujitsu. Now, let me tell you what I do. All right, so let's put these together. Deflect, defer, and disclose says, I didn't tell Austin what I do. I've asked him a bunch of questions. I've offered to help. The psychology is if you offer help to somebody, they're going to want to offer help back. If I'm offering to introduce Austin to Les and Sumner, he's going to give me his best people. If I'm asking for you know, president of ABC, the head of this company, the chairman of that one, president of a country, if Austin knows him, he's giving him to me. Because I just built a burden on him to help me because I helped him first. All right, so that's what you're going to try and do. And you can't always help somebody, and it doesn't matter. I'm going to show you some other situations around it. But this psychological burden is, let me tell you what I can do. Let me show you how I can help you. And now let me tell you what I do. Here's the other point. L.A. has a lot of what are called slashers. Does anybody know what slashers are in L.A.? Uh, model slash actor. Model slash actor. What do you do? I'm a writer, producer, director. I've got a film. I've got a website. It's like, pick one. Right? You meet people that are, here's the nine things I do. Please pick one. Hopefully... If you don't tell somebody what you do at first, and you know more about them, this person, you might tell them you're a writer because they're doing something that's relevant. And this person, when you disclose what you do, does that make sense? You can massage and manage your conversation of what you do when you know more about the person you're talking to. So find out about the people. Figure out how can I help them. But your goal when you disclose what you do is you can position yourself much more forcefully if you know the person you're talking to. So that's what referral currency is called. A couple ones we're wrapping up here. Learn how to call a referral. Right? Again, I, I love the earlier what you did. If it was it, aspirational, right? It's like pick up the phone, call somebody. Don't be afraid. I love that. What do you do when you call them? Well, there's a right way and a wrong way. And I'm going to teach you the right way. What you don't do is this. All right, somebody's got to role play with me again. Who wants to do it? Really simple. Somebody. What's your name? Nicole. All right. So I'm calling Nicole. Nicole's looking at her phone, right? We all have caller ID. I'm not in her phone. Nicole's going to answer the phone. So it's ringing. Answer the phone, Nicole. Hello. Hey, Nicole, this is Stephen Mead. I wanted to give you a call. I just left USC. And... Does that ever happen to you guys? You pick a phone, right? Your, your judgment call. Do I answer this? Who is it? You answer it, and somebody just dives right into a conversation. You're like, why did I pick this phone up? Who are, why are you calling me? You're like in the middle... So here's what we're going to do, and there's a sequence to it. If I do this, this again, wrong way to do it. Phone's ringing, ring, 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 answer. Hello? Hey, Nicole, this is Stephen Mead. If you pause, you're dead. Because what Nicole's doing is a judgment call in her mind. She's like, who? Do I know you? Why are you calling me? What are you selling me? <coughs> right? So it's, hey, Nicole, this is Stephen Mead. I got your name and number from Seth over at USC. No pause. And then the third part, the third component, no pause. I got your name and number from Seth over at USC. Did I catch you at a good time? So here's what happens in her mind. She's already forgot my name. She's moved on to, oh, I, well, I know Seth and USC. He must be calling for a reason. Yeah, you caught me at a good time or no, you didn't. The entire judgment goes to the referral and the credibility of that person sending you in. So it's, here's my name. I got your name and number from Seth. Did I catch you at a good time? Do not pause anywhere in there or you are dead because they're already going to be making value judgments on that phone call. Right, so I don't mind calling, but actually I love calling people now because nobody calls anymore. Years ago you used to call and you couldn't get anybody. Now everybody sends email or text because they're afraid to call. You'd be amazed who will pick up the phone when you call them. I've emailed people for six months. Six months. I, I, have, a, I have records, trust me. But I just forward the same email to them. I'll write a really great email, and then I'll just keep forwarding the same one. Hey, just send them below again. Hope to hear from you. Six months, nine months. Sometimes I'll pick up the phone and they'll answer. I'm like, of course. So don't be afraid to call. Learn how to make an introduction. Yes, Anna. Um, so I worked at a company where we were trying to get sponsors for an event, and 
we had all these CMOs, numbers, and names. Yeah. But the way we got that information was kind of more ambiguous. So like, yeah. people would be like, like, how'd you get my name? The CMO of Coke would be like, yeah, like, who is this? How did you get this number? Right. And we kept running into that, so we'd be like, oh, the, the Bentley thing, remember? And like, just making stuff. Like, right. how do you feel about this? I wouldn't do it because I would call my, I call, you know, Mark Janot who ran Coke new products and say, hey, Mark, who's the CMO? Can I get introduced to him? I'd find, I'd find somebody. It's, it's a different process. I've never made a cold call in my life because I learned this technique to get as many referrals as I need. Um, yeah, and if you're calling guys at that level, being morally ambiguous will be a, a tough one. Well, then another thing we did was we, we called someone in a different department and act like we had the wrong number and we'd be like, oh, can you direct us? And then oh, we'd be social like, engineering. That's like, hey, Kevin Mitnick Sandy and Ghost in the Wire. your number over in uh, advertising. Yeah. There's a guy named Kevin Mitnick. His book's Ghost in the Wires. That's the social engineering. That's how the guys hack into, you know, people's things. I, you, you can do it. I would... I would use techniques like this to get, but you were probably a job where they were giving you a list. Yeah, it's um, very strange. Yeah. <laughs> so, this one real quick, learn how to make an introduction. All right, again, some of this may not make sense to you now. As you move through your career, it will, especially if you do a lot of time at networking events or social events, all right? The last thing you want to do is, all right, I need two people, your name is? Kai. Kai and <clears throat> Brian. Last thing you want to do is, Hey, Kai, you should meet Brian. Brian, this is Kai, man. You guys should talk. Wrong answer. There's, like, about what? I mean, there's a million things you could do. All right, so you want to say, hey, this is Kai. Here's what he does. Just met him. Hey, Brian, here's what you guys should talk for this. Just when you make an introduction and make a, just establish some mutual point of interest. You're the one sitting in the middle. You're the linchpin. So just give a little context on that introduction to at least start a conversation point around the point of interest for both parties. All right, pretty simple stuff, but, but people don't know how to do it. On here, I have a big thing that I call refer versus recommend. I get this all the time. People are like, oh, well, you know, how, how are you going to do that? What about your reputation? What if you send somebody and the deal goes bad? I don't care. Here's why. I refer people all day long, but I refer it in context. Hey, I just met Kai. We were at USC. He's doing some cool stuff. I don't know much about him, but seems like he has something of interest you guys should talk. A referral is, I just met this person, here's what they do, but you're establishing a mutual point of interest. A recommendation is, I've known Seth for 10 years, I trust him, yeah, he would do an amazing job. You guys understand the difference? Some people are afraid to put themselves out there to help. Do it, but do it in a way that you couch and protect your reputation by saying, look, this is a referral, I just met the person, but I think they're doing something cool. Again, the, all of the slides that were earlier, these are just supporting and endorsing exactly what was said. Take meetings early and often, right? If you got referred to, to Sumner Redstone and Les Boonbees, what would you want to meet with Les for? Just ask about advice. Okay. Like career advice, how he got to where he was, and like what advice you get. Just okay. Advice. Perfect. Take meetings early and often means Take a meeting from a position of humility to learn, right? If somebody says, and I get this again a lot in entertainment, oh, well, you know, I want an agent in CA, but I'm not ready. Well, what do you mean? Whoa, well, I need more credits. I need more of this. I need extra that. Excuse me. If you can get a meeting, take a meeting with somebody under the premise of saying, hey, here's what I'm working on. What would it take to one day do business with you? What would it take to one day be represented with you? What would it take to one day be able to work in this company or to get where you are? It, it's a premise of going in, trying to learn what you need to grow into what you want to be. So don't ever be afraid of taking a meeting, but go in with the right attitude. What questions almost never asked? So Austin, if you had a meeting with Les, it's Les, right? Not Summer. Yeah. So we're throwing Austin I mean, in with Les. So like, realistically, if I had a meeting with Les, I feel like I wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't want to say, like, what can I do to help you? Because I did you guys hear what he said? So the question that's almost never asked is, what can I do to help? Because Austin said, why would I ask Les Moonbees that? Yeah. What, what could I do? So here's the problem with that, Austin. That's what most other people think. So if you just ask, you've already separated yourself from everybody else who's afraid to ask because it's Les Moonbees. So just by asking, you separate yourself from everybody else. 
But if you ask a better question, a better way, you're in a league all your own. All right, so here's, here's what I'm going to say. If, I agree. If you ask Les Moonbees, hey, this has been great, Les, I appreciate the lunch. You know, just what can I do to help you? Oh, no, awesome, great. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Pat you on the head, send you out the door. Yeah. Right? Because you asked the wrong question. You asked the wrong way. Here's the way you ask a question of somebody in a position of power. Again, isolation is a good thing. Target focus. Les, this has been great. Thank you so much. Just curious. Outside of everything you're working on, what are the top two or three biggest things you're working on right now? Outside of what we talked about, what are the one or two biggest problems you're trying to solve? Outside of this meeting, which has been great, what are the one or two things you're most passionate about that if I ever run across somebody, I'd love to be able to help you? You're going to ask a question that's always one or two or two or three. You've got to, it, it's never what can I do. It's too broad. The mind doesn't focus. He's got a million things he's thinking about. You have to force him to think about one or two or two or three specific things. All right? And it could be problems. I just was with, I'll give you two quick examples. Are we okay on time? This is yeah, two, two away from the last. I'll give you two quick examples. I was the other day with um, Paul Phipps. You guys would know who Paul Phipps is. He is CIO of Under Armour. Right? You guys know Under Armour? And, and I was actually pretty curious because I'm like, what does a CIO of Under Armour do? But rather than I, I asked him, I said, Paul, I'm just curious. I mean, what a cool job. We were hanging out with Tony Romo, who we know, and a bunch of people. And I was like, just curious. This year coming up, what are the two or three biggest initiatives you're working on at Under Armour? Like, as CIO, what do you do? What are the two or three biggest things you're working on? And he told me. It's like, I'm working on supply chain management. We want to go from four to seven billion. I'm working on disaster management, disaster recovery, and then one other thing. Now, what was interesting there, you guys remember Ronastar earlier? Right, what does Ronastar do? We help companies save money and we need CFOs. Ronastar is enterprise software. You guys don't need to know that. The point is, Paul's telling me this, I know four of the top people in the world that do supply chain management that he doesn't know. Former CEO of American Express is a friend of mine, guy that created supply chain management. Here's a guy, and I just, just met him. I'm like, wow, this is cool. So I'm offering to help him because I asked a different question. Does that make sense? All right, I'll tell you one more. This one's relevant to this room, and I don't usually have many stories that are relevant. A good friend of mine was chief of staff of NASA, right? Four presidential administrations. Every secret between the president and NASA he knew, pyramids on Mars, like crazy stuff. You guys don't have to believe me, but there's, you know, one, one day it may come out. There's some weird stuff out there. <laughs> But, but Courtney and I were talking, and I'd known him a little while, and one day I'm like, Courtney, I'm just curious. Let's set all the government stuff aside. This is the point, Austin, asking a better question. I said, what are you most passionate about? Like, what's the number one thing you're most passionate about right now that you're working on? And he stopped and he looked at me, and I, I can't always get through this story without getting emotional, so we'll see if I can handle it. He, he stops and he looks at me and goes, wow. He goes, actually, I am working on something. And he proceeds to tell me a story, and if I get the religious tenets wrong, I apologize, but he goes, during the concentration camps, when the priests were there, we, we the, the priests, the priests had a little Torah, right? It's a religious document. Because it was a little Torah, and they used it to study when they were in the concentration camp. They knew if they got caught with it, they'd be killed. And when the war was over, it was smuggled back out, and it's a very, you know, protected religious document in the Jewish faith. And, what we did at NASA is we gave it to the first Israeli astronaut ever going into space to take the Torah into space to get as close to God as possible. Wow, it's kind of cool. Because, yeah, and that was the challenger and it blew up. Because we're working on a documentary called The Tiny Torah, and I don't know anything about entertainment. I could use your help. All right Now, this is happening in Washington, D.C. I'm in L.A., and I'm like, well, I don't do movies, but... I know the guys that did the Passion of the Christ thing with Mel Gibson, and I know some guys that fund religious documents, and I knew three or four people that would help them, not my industry, but I put them in touch, and then four years later it got made. They changed it from the Tiny Torah, I don't remember the name, but the whole documentary got done. My point is this guy was extremely powerful. I asked a better question. 
So don't ever be afraid to ask the question, just ask it in a better way where you can try and help people. You never know what they're going to say. The last point of it, though, is really important. If you can't help them, if you can't help them, guys, it's okay. You now have an open door into some of the most powerful people in the world, and you know what their problem is to solve. So at some point in the future, you might find somebody that can help solve that problem. You've got an open door. If you know the two or three problems Les is working on, you run across somebody, you've got an open door to send him somebody to help solve his problem. Does that make sense? You're going to separate yourself just by asking a better question. That's what this is talking about. It's, it's all about asking good questions. Deflect, defer, and disclose is about learning how to gain control of a conversation, learn more about the other person, try to figure out how to add value. Specifically, what are the two or three things you're working on that I might be able to help you? Just asking better questions separates yourself. They're called the white elephant questions. Right? They're the questions in the room where you know it's over there, nobody wants to talk about it. You've got to learn to ask good questions. You've got to have the strength and character to ask questions that most other people don't ask. Finishing up real quick. This one's just a fun slide. I don't know why my pictures aren't very clear, but this one says, doesn't matter how many resources you have if you don't know how to use them. Those of you that can't see, it's a guy standing on a bunch of ladders peering over a wall because he doesn't know how to use the ladder. Experience is the greatest teacher. The problem with experience is it's also the slowest. That's what you're going to school for. How do you accelerate your knowledge? Learn, read books, study. Study the failures of other people. Whoever asked the question, I thought was a great question, which property did they not buy? Right? Like, What was the biggest mistake? I'm, I'm more fascinated by the mistakes and the failures than I am by the successes. You know, When you look at Steve Jobs, everybody's like, oh, Jobs was great. He failed with a device called the Newton. You guys probably wouldn't remember the Newton. It was this little PDA that learned your handwriting. It was one of the first ever generation. It's too smart, ahead of its time. Failed miserably. Casey Cowell, a US robotics, created something called the Palm Pilot and said, screw learning handwriting. Let's create a graffiti and make everybody learn a block of graffiti. And the first smartphone was a, per, a PDA because Jobs was too brilliant Casey was like, screw this. When you look at the failures, the failures are important. Sometimes it's timing, sometimes it's execution. Just learn. The only place success comes before failure is in the dictionary. This one again goes over good in the south, a little tough here. Eat like a bird, poop like an elephant. Does anybody want to take a guess what that means? Eat like a bird. A bird eats 50% of its body weight on a daily basis. It takes in a lot of food. The idea is how do you take in a lot of information? How do you, you know, read, read books, watch videos, watch TED Talks, watch all kinds, take in a lot of information, consume information to accelerate yourself past everybody else. Poop like an elephant means learn how to share that information as best you can, right? Develop skill sets and learn to share them with a lot of other people, but it's up to you to do the front end work to take that information out. Just gotta learn how to, to put it together uh, last one, I think, become a good negotiator. This one will serve you well. Does any of you ever watch Pawn Stars with Rick and those guys? Yeah. All right. It's great. There's a couple really simple negotiation techniques I'm going to teach you will serve you well. Whether it's a job offer, whether it's a finance offer, it does not matter. I'm going to teach you a couple of them. First one <coughs> is the flinch factor. I learned this one painfully when I was... I don't know, in my 30s. It cost me, I won't tell you how much it cost me, but it was north of $200 million. This I'm about to teach you because I didn't learn this. Here's what the flinch factor is. It's a psychological technique. It is super easy. Every one of you guys can do it. Who wants to play with me? Who wants to participate? Great. What's your name? James. James. I'm about to try and sell a car. James is coming to look at my car. I have an automobile here. It's a beautiful automobile. It is $10,000 is what I'm asking for the car. James is going to offer me $7,500. He's going to come in as a low ball, hard negotiator. All right? So let's play along, James. Yeah. Here's my car. It's beautiful. What do you think? I'm asking $10,000. What will you give me? How much? $7,500. Okay, I'll take it. 
I want you guys to think right now what's going through your head. Was it worth 10000 Could I got it for less? Should I have offered five? Because I accepted so quick, he's already doubting the price that he gave me that was so far under what I was asking. All right, so let's play again. This is my car. James, what do you think? It's $10,000. Make me an offer. $5,000. Uh, man, I was, before you came in, I was going to ask you for like twelve. You know, but I, I kind of like you, 10,000, man, there's no way I could go, I could maybe go nine. So the pr first part is just the flinch. If he had offered me 7,500, I'm going to flinch. If he offered me 9,500, I'm still going to flinch. Right? The first job offer you get, even if it's more than you want, flinch. Because the other person's going to feel better about the decision. Right? If he offered me 9,500, and I'm like, ooh, 95, I'm, man, I, you know, I could probably do that, but boy, it, it would be tough on me, but if you really want it, you know, I can do it. He's going to feel better about 9,500 than he would at 7,500 if I didn't flinch. Does that make sense? Just a simple technique, but the psychology of it is there. Now, the difference, too. Yeah. You're my friend. friend that is kind of... Exactly. I like you... Right, but if I did that at 9,500, James feels good about the car because I flinched. What James doesn't know is I only wanted 8,000 for it. I asked for more than I wanted. I was willing to come down, but it's all in how you handle that negotiation. So that's one. Second one, he who speaks first loses. This, again, is the Pawn Star one. Rick and these guys are really good. Right? Hey, you know, Kai, that's a great you know, laptop you're selling. How much you want for it? And there's silence. Right? He's asking the closing question and then you shut up. How much do you want for that? And then you shut up. He who speaks first loses. When you ask that closing question, are you ready to get started today? You know, it's a million and a half dollars. Are you ready to write the check? You ask a question and you shut up. And you may have to sit there. I've sat in meetings three, four, five minutes. And there's silence and it gets uncomfortable. <laughs> The longest I went one time was about eight and a half minutes. <laughs> but it was a blast because the guy I was up against in a contract negotiation also had sales technique. And he knew what I was doing and I knew what he was. And so six minutes in, we're just laughing at each other because we know we're not going to say anything. Right? So when you're up against somebody who knows what you're doing, it's fun. But he who speaks first loses. Ask a question, but always, always, always flinch. It'll make the other person feel better. You'll get what you want. All right, closing. This one's really quick. Feel my great truths. Again, you can have the slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Greatest strength is your greatest weakness. People make decisions emotionally and defend them logically. Think about it. That's why you can't argue with people that are in bad relationships or bad businesses. They're, they're emotional. You're logical. You can't argue. People make decisions emotionally. Ask not why. Ask why not. Why won't this work? Why can't we get started today? Why isn't this a good idea? You know, ask why not. Solicit negative feedback. Solicit crit criticism because that's the true feedback you want. But solicit in a way that's positive. If you say it, they doubt it. If they say it, it's true. You can run around all day long and talk about how great your product is. It doesn't matter until the other person says it. So try and elicit ways. Three R's. Right? This was, this was where I started, Seth, and then Ken took it to the three C's. I work with people a lot. Like a guy just asked me today, I, I was helping him on Sunday, he goes, well, what can I do to help you? I'm like, look, there's three things. You can give me referrals to help me with my business because I'm giving you referrals. Right? You can give me recognition. If I help you, tell other people I've helped you. There's just some credibility. Or give me referral. If I send you somebody that funds your company, just pay me out of that. I'm not asking for money up front. The point is people love recognition. If somebody helps you in school, they help you find a job, if they help you fi find a car, give them recognition in front of other people. It just makes them feel good. All right? Give referrals to help businesses or give, give um, revenue. Questions are the key to the universe. We cover that. Ask a lot of good questions. Begin with the end in mind. That was to design your destiny. He who speaks first loses. We just did. And this one, you've got to work on this one. Really, really tough. 99% of the things you worry about never happen, so why worry? We worry about so many things that are beyond our control. We can't worry about them. 
And then networking techniques. If you guys, any of you guys do networking events or going to? All right, if you do, this will help you tremendously. Uh, these are just a couple little techniques and then we're done. So I do a lot of events. If I'm doing some of the bigger events, we do some really cool ones. It's Clean Global. It's who's milking back here? Yeah. Yeah, we'll do Milken, Clean Global, Rockefeller, Ted. I mean, we do some cool events. If I'm going to an event, I'll do a bunch of different things. One, you know, if I'm at an event, I don't know anybody. I'll find the host. I'll find somebody that's there and ask them to do introductions for me. But if I'm asking that host to make an introduction, I'm using a tornado technique to say. Hey, there's 400 people in the room, Seth, at your Emmy party. I'd love to do, by the way, can I tell you what I'm working on? Maybe there's somebody here I should meet. Here's what I'm doing. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm going to isolate down to have Seth introduce me to somebody. Because as the host, that's kind of their job, but you have to make it easy for them. All right? Number two, I do this one a lot. You guys will think it's weird and creepy. Um, kind of looks that way. Have you ever seen after a panel when the panelists get off the stage and they're standing there and everybody lines up behind them to talk to them? I stand beside the guy or the girl. And you'll walk up and they'll look at you and like, what are you doing? And I just stand there. Here's why. There's a bunch of things you learn from that. Number one, I learned how that CEO or that person is answering questions. Right? How are they interacting with people that are asking smart questions and stupid questions and pitching everything under the sun? I want to learn and get better. So I'm learning how that person answers questions. But what I'm also learning, right, if you're standing in line and you're 12 people deep, who are you meeting while you're in line? Like, who are you talking to? Nobody. There's somebody in front of you and behind you. You're just standing there. I'm next to the speaker. I get to hear what 20, 30, 40 people are pitching the speaker. I don't have time to run around a room to 300 people going, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? I'll stand next to the speaker and I've learned what 30, 40 people do because I hear what they're pitching the speaker. Now I can more efficiently pick who I want to go talk to. And then the last thing is when I do talk to the speaker, I've heard him enough to know who he's going to send somebody to talk to, who he's going to do, you know, what he's interested in. And I did this once with um, Bobby Kennedy, one of, the, one of the Kennedys, never big presidential material because he talks like he's always crying voice is, is, just doesn't resonate well. But I stood next to him and he was working on a water project, doing something with water keepers, and I listened to all these people pitching ideas, Lisa Boyle, Plastic Pollution Coalition, you should eliminate plastic bags, and Bobby's like, it'll never work. It was interesting. But by the time about 22 people went down, I, I you know, said, Mr. Kennedy, this has been great, I've learned a lot. Um, by the way, can I ask you one quick question? He said, yeah. I go, can I have Joe's number because the plastic project you guys are working on for river keepers, I think I can help you accomplish your goal. The point was I'd heard him give Joe's name three or four times. I heard him talk about what his goals were. It didn't matter what I did. He was going to send me off to somebody else anyway. But the question was, can I talk to Joe because I have something that will help you accomplish your goal. And what he did was fascinating. He goes, do you have a pen? I was like, yeah. He goes, all right, give me your card. Gave him my card, gave him my pen. He wrote his personal cell phone on the back. He's like, here's my personal cell. Call me. I'll help you out. Fascinating, because he, for 30 people lined up, he had never done that. But just standing there and listening, you learn a lot. So do that. Do your homework in advance, meaning who's going to be at the event. A lot of times I'll send an email out saying, I'm going to this event. If you know anybody, let me know. By the way, here's the list of speakers. If you know anybody speaking, I'd love to meet them. Right? Leverage your network. You never know who's going to know. If Wes is on a panel and you're going to some event, send it out. Somebody's going to know them and introduce you in advance of that event. So send an email out. And Oh, that's it. That's it. So there's all my information. If you have questions, let me know. We'll, we'll do questions real quick. And anybody that wants a slide deck, I'm going to leave it with Seth. But that's it. Hopefully it helped. Thanks. It depends on what you're there for and what they're there for. You know, I mean, it, there is no right or wrong answer. My, my point in standing next to the speaker is I learn how they're answering things and I learn who they're talking to and I learn what's important to them. So I can position what I want to talk to them about more relevant. It's like a deflect a bird situation. I'm not going to stand in line and pitch in my idea 
if I can stand there and listen to them and know what's important to them, I'll position my idea differently. And it doesn't matter. I mean, if we're in nine different industries, five of which I know nothing about. Doesn't matter. You know, but but you learn a lot about what they're interested in and who they talk to. So when you do say, "Here's what I do," you can just position yourself better. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, this is kind of like a two-part question. Um, one of them is. Can you find this ideal size of like air network and tied to that, one of the things I find that I often struggle with is I'll do a lot of recruiting and I'll go through a lot of networking and I'll make this large network, but then just trying to upkeep it, especially during the school year when you may not be in the same type of environment mm -hmm. or not seeing the latest news or I don't know, like some sort of thing tied into their like exact uh, industry. Really just how many people do you really think you should have in that inner network and how often do you think you tap back out to them as well as how do you just manage that so that okay. it's not like two years in between? And, and that was a two-part question and I have a three-part answer. Perfect. So answer one is we're about to build an app, I think we're going to build an app, I want to forever called Five Peeps, which there should be the five most important people for whatever you're doing. Five people that, that, are, that, that are there or that are credible or that are friends or that are support. So finding those five peeps is tough because you've got to find the right people. So that's one. Two, and Seth knows this, I have a program I've used for years called ACT, A-C-T. Everybody I meet, I enter in, and it takes time. But I enter in where I met them, what they were wearing, what we talked about. Did you show them where, can you, it's, you kind of have to see it to get your degree of insanity, because it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, just, I need my computer from the back to feel. <laughs> yes, sir. Just grab my back, Seth, and we'll set it up while we're talking. So the example I was telling Eva from him, from the Stephen, yeah, thanks, so was I talking about like New York, like going to New York. Yeah, I have there. probably 17,000 names in my database. So when I meet somebody, I put them into, I put them into categories and groups. So if I meet somebody and they're in California, I put them in California. Are they entertainment? Are they specific in entertainment? Are they investors? Like, I've got groups set up. So if I'm going to San Francisco, if I'm going to San Francisco or New York, I can just instantly pull up everybody in New York. So I manage 17,000 names. Yeah, there we go. So I manage 17,000 names through, through a database. All right, but that's the third part of the answer. The second part of the answer was remember when I talked about tornado technique? Again, I, I keep doing this. You guys remember what Magmo does? What are, what are we creating? It's sort of Instagram on, Instagram on steroids, right? And there's a couple people I'm trying to meet. The, the easier way to manage relationships is if all you're trying to do is remember key points of what your brain will process, right? So if you know what, again, I keep using Austin Les Moonbees. If you know the three or four things Les Moonbees wants or Paul Phipps or Seth, it's easy to manage those relationships. Not easy to type, but it's easy to manage. I turned it off. There we go. There we go. Um, here's all contacts. So I've got 17,000 names in here. I can pick somebody. Here's Larry Polhill. Um, has a cafe and food in Starbucks. Was referred by Rosemary. Uh, I've got him in different groups. He's an angel, Magmo, he's a potential investor on a short list. If I want to go to New York, I'll pull my New York group up. So over here, I've got, here's my entire New York group. My whole New York group has, I don't know, 1,200 people, but everybody I meet in New York, I'm not going to invite to my event. So under my New York group, which is everybody in New York, I have people I only invite to my event and I can look them up. There's 1163, and if I want to write an email, I do an email, mail merge, right here. I pick one of my templates I've written to invite them. I hit next, I'm gonna send it to that contact. I hit next, I'm not gonna do it now. I can send 1100 emails in three minutes. So managing relationships for me, I've got to go up to San Francisco, same thing, I'll, I'll hit my San Francisco group, but it's in California, and under California, I've got San Francisco. You know, so I can pull all of these guys up, and it tells me as much as I can, 
where I met them. You know, here's Crunch Fund, Abby. Quasi Asari I spoke to, works with Michael Arrington. Anybody know Michael Arrington, created TechCrunch? Quasi Asari worked for me. Quasi ran digital for Sean Combs. Yeah, Puff Daddy. Yeah, for Puff Daddy. Quasi worked for me. That's who I got into. There, if I want to know who introduced me to Quasi Asari, I can look Quasi up. And yeah, so all of this stuff is just, it takes time. But I've got it down, and I'll go to Quasi. And Quasi is going to be Tony because Tony Alferrero introduced me to him. If I want to know who introduced me to Tony, then I go back to my friend Brad. And if I want to know Brad, I met Brad at a conference. I can track all of this through relationships. Um, so again, it's it's a three-part answer. Answer one is five peeps, keep them there. Answer two is if you if you have little nuggets of information, it's easy to reach out to people. It's easy to say thank you. It's easy to send you know notes of interest. But I've organized things in a very specific way. If I want to send one email to seventeen thousand, I can. If I just want to segment out. You know, I've got a group in there that's just entertainment. So if I want to send an email to just people in entertainment, I just click that and I've got 1,400 people just in entertainment who referred me, what they were wearing. And again, guys, the reason I take all those notes is your mind will remember it. I create the visual. If I know what they were wearing, what we talked about, where we were, your mind will remember that picture a lot better than it just will a card. You know, which is why when I was talking about Seoul, Korea, we were... You know, I still remember the table I was sitting at. It was Sumner Redstone. It was Will I Am. It was the president of Korea. It was the head of GE. I remember where we were sitting. I have what they were wearing. I have what we talked about. You know, so it, it, it takes a little time, but mentally it, it burns the pictures in your mind to be more efficient. Yeah, just to, just to fill this in a little bit, some of you probably are like, what does this have to do with digital media? What does it have to do with the curriculum? But I like you guys. I think this is, if I were your age, I would want somebody like me to bring this to you, and here's why. Because one of the moments that changed my life was, does anybody remember a show called Iconoclast? So Brian Grazer, Ron Howard's partner is on the show, and he's in the back of a limo, and he, he pulls out this paper, and it's a list of everybody that he knows in his life, and he's incredibly successful, right? He made some of the biggest movies of all time. But part of his process, if you know him, is he's just a great, he's a great networker, he knows everybody that he needs to know. And so he had this list of everybody that he knows, and he was just going through it. And around that time, I was sitting with you, I think, and you were showing me this. And I don't do it to this level of detail, but one of the things that you do is every time you go to New York, right, it says, dear so-and-so, dear Eva, dear Brian, hey, it's, it's me, I'm coming to New York, I'm going to be here from date date to whatever, and, and let me know if you want to meet. I do that now, yep. learning it from you. If I go to New York for three days, I'm book solid. I don't have to think about it because I know so many people who know me right. that I've paid attention to, that I've tried to do favors for, that like, it's just constantly feeding the network. And so you're not thinking about, oh, what do I have to, what do, I have to do to get this next job? You're, you're always helping people and paying it forward, and, and right. they, they always want to help you. You don't have to ask. And if you build, like, and, and, and that's great that Seth's talking about, like, when I go to New York and San Francisco, I'll do an email like that, but I also do my own event. I throw a happy hour networking event. And it's always, I've worked for years to prepare. I do a 530 day 30. It's a cash bar. I don't pay for things. I get some bar where we can have our own section. Nine, and I email everybody. I'll email 4,000 people. Hey, I'm going to be in New York. Because I don't, I don't send an email a lot of times just to my New York group because there's people that travel. But I'll throw an event when I'm in another city. I'll have 40 people show up that I may not see, I don't have time for. They're all networking, they're doing deals. What am I doing there? I'm building referral currency. You know, people ask me why I do the events, why don't you make money at it? I, I, I'm owed a lot of favors in this town. Not in a bad way, I like helping people, but when I need things done, you know, can call. So the, this organization of a list actually really helps me to be able to go into a city and say, hey, I'm gonna be in Chicago on the 23rd. Anybody wanna meet 5.30 to 8.30, I'd love for you to come by. Or send me somebody you think that is a quality person. And I'll end up getting introductions and people send and people stopping by that I would have never met on my own because I sent an email out. I'm, I'm hyper efficient on cash flow. I'm not buying big dinners. I'm not doing big sponsors. It's cocktail art. People are big boys. They can pay for their own. They've got corporate accounts. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to be efficient and do this. But that's, that's kind of how that one works. So does that help? Yeah. Okay. 
One more, two more. Nothing else? Wow, I got off easy on this one. Okay. How do I go about doing this? Is there a quick way to start tracking contacts and to go to the job force? Or is there, is there a you, big you, exception you, to this? You've got to find, for the contact stuff, this one's called ACT. I buy it every year. It's a $160, so it's not overly expensive. There's some new ones that have come out, Nimble. Um, High rise. There's there's some other kind of CRM systems that are out there that work better than your phone, you know, or Outlook. Um, find one. I just I like that one because I've used it forever. But Outlook doesn't do it. And your phone won't do it. And, and again, if you get good at this, guys, you're going to learn more about what people do, how to help them. You'll you'll start building this sort of relationship capital. This just makes you more efficient in whatever you do moving forward. Anything else?